I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. This month's program addresses an issue that we have not really covered in depth, and that's the separation of church and state. Some of the social and political controversies that we experience in our nation have aspects that relate to religion and the government. When the distinction between church and state is blurred, Americans' freedom is jeopardized, and abuses can come either from the church end of things or from the government end of things. Since 1947, a nonprofit organization, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, has focused exclusively on preventing those abuses and protecting the separation of church and state. Americans United educates the general public and public officials, and when needed, they also take legal action. We have as guests three members from the uh, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Dennis Mansker, Kent Underwood, and Eric Quist. Good to have you both, both, <laughs> all three of you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank and you. Uh, let's start with just the concept of what, what do we mean by separation of church and state? Well, we need to look no farther than the First Amendment to the Constitution, which starts out, Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And we call that our first freedom, because this comes very first in all of the uh, Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments, <laughs> <laughs> the Ten, uh, First Ten Amendments, uh, the Bill of the Rights, Bill of Rights uh, it's number one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and um, we, the, the, uh, the part that you quoted is referred to as the Establishment Clause, because it says that Congress shall not establish. Well, well technically, the first part of that is the Establishment right. Clause. The second part is the Free Exercise Clause. Toge right. Together, they're the Religious Clause. Right. So um, uh, what else can we say about the, the separation of church and state in the Constitution or in the minds of the people who founded this country? Well, I think that Thomas Jefferson said it best when he described it as a wall of separation erected between the church and the state. Mm -hmm so that they shall be kept separate. Because any time, this is one of your favorite quotes, any time that you intermingle the two, it makes for bad policy and bad theology. Right, yeah, and, and it, it, the separation really protects both. Protects both sides. From, mm -hmm. from interference by the other. Uh, there's a quotation I like from uh, James Madison that was in some materials. Uh, this is from 1823, some decades after the Constitution. He said, the settled opinion here is that religion is essentially distinct from civil government and exempt from its cognizance that a connection between them is injurious to both. And that's mm -hmm. what we just said. Uh, is there anything else to add? Well, taken to its extremes, the intermingling of politics <clears throat> and religion leads to things such as the Spanish Inquisition and, and other very serious uh, ills to society, yeah. essentially. Yeah, we see this happening with the Taliban uh, trying to operate uh, portions of Af Afghanistan under their interpretation of what a religious requirement is. Exactly. It, it opens up to the abuse of power uh -huh. and the abuse of authority uh -huh. and the abuse of authority from the government. Uh, religion can get into the government uh -huh. and force its views on other people uh -huh. or the government can get into religion and force its views yeah. into the theology, yeah. and both of which are very detrimental yeah. to each yeah. uh, organization. I think it's very important that we respect uh, our constitutional right to uh, practice the religion of our choice or, or not practice any religion for that matter. Mm -hmm. And that's what AU is about to protecting that uh, right. freedom. Yeah, because within that organization, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, you've got the full spectrum yes. of all different religious beliefs and people who are not religious or. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's the full range of everybody. It, it does. It runs the gamut from militant atheists on one end to evangelical Christians on the other. Yeah, yeah and everybody in between. And everybody in between. So. It's, it's uh, several of the people on the National Advisory Committee, which uh -huh. I'm on. Uh -huh. uh, one guy's a Baptist minister from Oklahoma. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, and the head of the organization, Barry Lynn, is a is an minister, minister of the United right. Church of Christ. Right. So. And our uh, new president of the Board of Trustees is a rabbi. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I think we could sum this up a little bit by saying that 
The AU is a diverse organization made up of people from various walks of faith, not just Christian, but mm -hmm. others, non-Christian. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Dennis said, uh, some atheists, agnostics, mm -hmm. and some, some maybe lesser known religions. Yeah. The whole point is to protect our right, whether you're Baptist, Christian, Catholic, uh, or an atheist, or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, that leads into the, the notion that you hear sometimes where people say, well, this is a this was founded to be a Christian nation. And your response to that is? No, it was not. Uh -huh. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And, and I, I've seen quotations in materials I've read uh, where the Jefferson and Madison and a number of other people were explicit. What, what some people don't fully understand is uh, that Thomas Jefferson actually rewrote the Bible and he deleted all references to Christ's divinity. Uh -huh. So my question would be to people who say that the United States is founded as a Christian nation, how do you reconcile that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think deism is closer to Thomas Jefferson's yeah. view, yeah. which uh, many people would claim is contrary to traditional Christianity. Yeah. Uh, we also have Thomas Paine, uh, very significant in the foundation of our country, uh, a deist. He mm -hmm. certainly wouldn't be. A, a Christian yeah, right. in that they believe the Bible um, is the literal word of God and, and the other Christian doctrine. So the difference just between theism and deism yeah. is very significant in the early foundation of the, of the nation. So the idea that it's a Christian nation yeah. really is, is not correct. Yeah, and then when the, the, the Constitution was written without that in it, and then the, the, the various states said, well, we're not so sure we want to have this new Constitution yet, and so to get the states, the colonies, to buy into the idea of this, they had to create the Bill of Rights, which included mm -hmm. the separation of church and state, among other rights, the first ten amendments. Right. And although they were certainly free to do so, God isn't mentioned once in the Constitution. And the, uh, the closest thing that you can come to, a re to religion being mentioned in the Constitution, I can't remember the uh, article, but it's, uh, there shall be no religious test for anyone holding office. That's right. Right. And that's not a clear indication that yeah. this is you know, not yeah. a Christian nation. There was a, a <laughs> treaty, soon after this nation was founded, there was a, uh, a, a military conflict uh, and it was, it was settled by the Treaty of, with Tripoli, mm -hmm. and that was in 1797, and the U.S. Senate unanimously approved that treaty with Tripoli, and that, uh, uh, let's see, the quotation from Article 11 of that treaty specifically says, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. There, there had been concern from people in Tripoli in that area that uh, the United States was trying to impose Christianity upon what was traditionally a Muslim area. Mm -hmm. and, and in settling this, they had to say, no, no, that's not what we're trying to do. And in fact, um, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. And that was approved by the U.S. Senate in 1797. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can understand why the Muslims were, were you know, apprehensive about this, because they, up to that point, they'd been dealing with European nations, all of which have a state church, and dictating That's certain right. practices. That's right. You know, they, uh, you know if, you, if you were going to attack a Muslim country, it was a yeah. crusade. Right, right. <laughs> and this American experiment was, was something to get out of that yes. mm -hmm. European baggage where this is a Catholic country, or that's a Lutheran country, or this is the Church right. of England that runs right. this place, or, you know, yeah. Um, uh, Eric, you have a, a concern about uh, freedom of religion. We've mm -hmm. been talking about this as a constitutional right. principle, right. and um, uh, separation of church and state actually protects freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some more about that? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think uh, there's two main aspects to that. The first is we are guaranteed our right to worship as we please. Uh, we are uh, guaranteed a right to uh, our own beliefs without imposition, without someone else imposing their beliefs by force of law. Uh, and the other thing is too, we also have a right to not have a religion or not to worship. And that's the other side of, of that coin too. So uh, it's basically freedom, I think it's up it should be up to each individual to decide what he or she wants to believe in. And that, to me, is freedom of religion. Yeah. There's also a related concept, or you can kind of turn it a little bit and think about 
government-sponsored religion. And I wonder right. if you could tell us about that concept, what that's Yeah, I, I will. I've, I've thought about this a lot, and, and I was a history major in college, so I uh -huh. tend to remember some of this stuff. <clears throat> but um, a lot of our forefathers came to this country to escape uh, the imposition of religion. And they came over here and founded colonies. Well, what they did is maybe they were uh, running from the Anglican church in, in England, so they'd come over to the colonies and they'd set up a, a different kind of church, and then they would, uh, that would be the colony's official religion. Well, then it didn't take too long before people realized that they were doing the same thing here uh, that they were trying to get away from back in England. And I think that, uh, you know, it didn't take them too long before they finally figured out that you know, this is not going to work. We're going to have to come to some resolution, and the separation of church and state was yeah. that resolution. Well, and, the, and the, like you said, the different colonies had different settling. So, like, Maryland was settled by Catholics, right. and, right. you know, Pennsylvania right. was settled by Quakers, and right. so I, you can imagine trying to form a nation where somebody says, wait a minute, this is, you know, how do we make a nation when, when each of us has a separate thing? So, there's just all kinds of well, complexity and trouble. And I, I personally believe that the freedom of religion is one of the great strengths of this country. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the uh, reasons we are as great as we are. That's why I'm so concerned about preserving the freedom of religion. There's a quotation from uh, James Madison uh, who uh, wrote in 1822, religion flourishes in greater purity without than with the aid of government. Absolutely correct. What we have found is uh, that in Europe, where many countries still have state-sponsored religion, uh, you know, people are forced to pay taxes to support a religion that may not be their own, number one. And number two, uh, there's not as much interest in those countries as there is in religion and mm -hmm. going to church. Mm -hmm. There's not as much interest there as there is here where we don't have that kind of uh, regime. Right, yeah. In, in a lot of European countries where there is governmental support for the church by taxation or mm -hmm. whatever, um, church attendance is lower and belief is lower. In mm -hmm. the United States where you have this mm -hmm. competition of multiplicity of mm -hmm. religions plus no religion, uh, right. people are free to do what they want and mm -hmm. more likely to attend and, and even to believe. Well, you know, it seems to me that... <clears throat> I, I've always believed that a person should go to, to a particular church because he or she wants to, not because somebody is forcing them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's also the potential that if, I mean, suppose you are the head honcho of some national church body mm -hmm. and you're getting government funding mm -hmm. and you find that as a matter of faith that your church doesn't like something the government is doing, say mm -hmm. committing a war someplace mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. doing some other practice that you find uh, wrong in light of your faith, it would be hard for you as a church body or the believers, mm -hmm. members of your church, to disagree publicly with the government because you'd be r running the risk of biting the hand that feeds you. That's exactly right. You know, that's it's a what, corrupting influence on the belief. And that's, that's what Kent was we were talking yeah. about earlier, about you start to uh, intermingle government and religion, yeah. and you're just creating all kinds of grief yeah. that we don't need and uh, shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Kent, there's a, a concept that you've referred to as church politicking, and um, that's, you know, we've talked about what happens when government meddles in religion, and there's also the flip side when religion inappropriately meddles with government in um, electoral matters, for example. So tell us something about that. Yes. <clears throat> the uh, tax-exempt status that churches have mm -hmm. um, prohibits uh, opposing or endorsing a specific candidate or a specific piece of legislation mm -hmm. uh, from the pulpit. Uh, to do so violates a tax-exempt status, and that's to, to prohibit and prevent the abuses that mm -hmm. we've been referring to. Um, however, there's currently uh, efforts underway from uh, different organizations to actually go and publicly endorse candidates or mm -hmm. legislation in violation of the tax-exempt status requirement mm -hmm. in order to challenge that law. And mm -hmm. that uh, bites away at uh, the protection uh, that we have, mm -hmm. the separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to not allow specific endorsement of candidates mm -hmm. in legislature from the pulpit. 
Um, there's the, the great possibility of abuse, of people being felt like they need to vote in a particular way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ultimately money gets involved. Mm -hmm. And the corrupting influence of money in politics and the money in religion eats away at the purity and the integrity of the belief system, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the integrity of the uh, uh, governmental policies mm -hmm. and organizations. You also have a concern about uh, defending the courts. Uh, the, the courts in our system are responsible for making sure that the Constitution and the laws are protected from abuse by anybody. Yeah, can you imagine a situation where um, a church organization is specifically endorsing a particular judge? So if you have elected judges like we have in Washington, and a religious organization specifically endorses a judge and then has legislation, a school and prayer, a uh, prayer in a school, mm -hmm. or other types of faith-based initiatives, et cetera. And then to have that judge rule on those types of issues really clouds the impartiality mm -hmm. uh, and the non-bias that a judge mm -hmm. is supposed to have. And again, you can see the corrupting yeah. influence of money and, and yeah. votes. And we, we see this in, in uh, the state of Washington in the last several years with, with big money coming in to mm -hmm. affect uh, state Supreme Court races. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually legislation in the legislature to try to limit that because that same thing happens in, in, in the realm of commerce as well, and, and certainly with uh, religion, religion needs to be kept clean uh, and the judicial system needs to be kept clean. And judges need to be impartial so that they can look at the law, look at the facts that are before them, apply the facts to the law without that uh, corrupting influence. And it would be really unfortunate, taken to the extreme. Mm -hmm. You can start imposing various religious doctrines mm -hmm. into laws. And mm -hmm. if you have judges that are essentially mm -hmm. purchased, and mm -hmm. I, I mean that because of uh, contributions, mm -hmm. uh, endorsements of large political groups, mm -hmm. you can then start to see uh, types of legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when the judges rule on particular applications of the law, you're going to see that corrupting influence. And uh, we, we need to keep uh, the institutions pure. I might say, too, that I'm thinking as you're speaking, and the problem, the, the ultimate extension of this is, I think, it undermines the judicial system. Right. If judges aren't perceived as being impartial, that undermines right. our whole legal That's system. Right. I think that is yes. a serious problem. It, really, yeah. it, it does, yeah. Um, Dennis, uh, a lot of the problems that we hear about in the news where church and state come into conflict come through the school system, public schools. And um, uh, I want to talk about that for a bit. I know you have an interest in this. What kinds of problems do you see with uh, violations of the separation of church and state in public schools? It generally comes down to one of two issues. Prayer and school are some variation on that and uh, teaching of evolution. Uh -huh. And uh, we, since 1962, prayer has been illegal in public schools. In, in the form of a formal a formal thing. prayer. But an but individual can do what they individual want. Individual can do what they want. Nobody yeah. you know this is when you know the Supreme Court kicked God out of the classroom. Yeah. Well nothing like that happened. Right. People are still but they there's like an organized effort that we've seen lately. The, before nineteen sixty two there the church state cases were very rare. Mm -hmm. And then after nineteen sixty two and moving on uh, it just like a blossoming, a blooming mm -hmm. of church state cases before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be all conspiracy theory mm -hmm. on this, but I do know that the religious right is well funded mm -hmm. and they are, uh, it's like the example you use where they're, they're challenging the legality mm -hmm. of that, the IRS rules. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing that, they're trying to slip in prayer mm -hmm. wherever they can mm -hmm. and the, uh, the teaching of evolution, you know, it's, you know, they say they want now they want to teach the controversy. Well, there isn't any controversy. Right. You know, 99.9% .9 of uh, biologists, ag you know, agree right. on the theory of evolution. Like they say it's just a theory. Well, it's just a theory, but so is gravity. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The the um, uh, we can talk about the, the case in Dover, Pennsylvania, yeah. in just a moment. But the 
Yeah, the, the science is really clear about this. It's, it's just like, you know, I remember a few decades back when the public was trying to minimize smoking and get labels on the cigarette packages and stop the advertising of tobacco on TV and stuff. And the, the tobacco companies, were they'd find some doctor someplace who would say, oh, I'm not so sure that smoking is bad for you. And then it would be, they're, they're trying to create um, unease in the public mind to make it think like the science wasn't settled. Yeah. And the science actually is settled that smoking yeah. really does cause cancer and heart disease and all right. kinds of stuff. Right. And the fact that the tobacco company could find a doctor or two here and there doesn't mean that that's up for grabs and uncertain. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and ca I kind of blame the media for a lot of this because mm -hmm. they love that. They love the controversy. They like that, and sure. they like to be able to play like an even-handed thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. as it's, if not it's not really so. even-handed if you got one person here against yeah. you know a million here. Right, and it's the same <laughs> thing. It's the same thing with the uh, climate change, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, where the yeah. the climate scientists are virtually unanimous. Yeah. And then there's a couple of people on the on the payroll of the oil companies saying, "Well, I'm not so sure." Yeah, no, right. So, but the the this intelligent design really is not science because it doesn't meet a whole lot of scientific right method uh, criteria. And you know, we can, we kind of get smug here in the Pacific Northwest because we kind of live in this liberal yeah. bastion. But whenever, I'm, whenever I get too smug about it, I remember that the, there's an outfit called the Discovery Institute, yeah. which is based in Seattle, right. mm -hmm. which is uh, the main proponent and think tank for yeah. intelligent design. Yeah. And who knows, I don't know where their funding comes yeah, from. Yeah, I don't know. But the, the science, has, it's really been debunked as oh, not yeah. science. Mm -hmm. But it's a back doorway of, of, of doing evolution. I, I, I think it's fine if they want to teach intelligent design, but if they do it on their nickel, on their time, yeah. And, and don't try to impose it in the public school that, and that's system. The, that's the difference. It's not like saying you can't, we don't allow that thought. No. But if they want to have a workshop, bring some speakers, rent right. a hall, right. advertise it and get people to come out, that's right. fine. But don't right. use tax dollars to publish, right. to publicize something or why, indoctrinate people. That's, why use my tax dollars to teach kids something that's not going to help them? Right. Particularly in this environment that we have today where the United States is trying to compete globally. Yeah. You know, now maybe, you know, some uh, talk of intelligent design in high school or something isn't going to destroy their competitiveness. But taken to its logical extreme, yes, it, it would. Well, and it and does undermine the scientific method. We need to have and, people and, trained in, yeah. in hard sciences. We don't need to blur that with unscientific. Now, I'm not saying I'm against religion. I'm just saying have religion is, belongs in one place and the schools yeah. belong in another, and yeah. we should keep yeah. them separate. Yeah. But, you know, through, well, you, you mentioned history. You know that through American history uh, in particular, there's been a, an anti-intellectual strain yes. that's yeah. run through, and occasionally it'll pop up and then mm -hmm. go underground. I remember when... Uh, uh, George Wallace called university yeah. professors pointy-headed intellectuals, right, yeah, right. you know, kind of snarly <laughs> lip of his. Right, right. And yeah. uh, now we're, I think we're, we're seeing it come to the surface yeah, again. Yeah. yeah, it's coming back, I think, where, where somebody who thinks logically and clearly is suspect yes. somehow. Yeah. Yes. And, and what you should do is just run with your gut instinct. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's a good way to settle public policy. I don't think so either. <laughs> so, um, so, um, how could parents or students or other people uh, deal with issues when they come up in schools? Because they, they often they so often come up at the, at very local levels. Yes, the very local within levels. local school, individual schools, or yeah, they are the uh, the religious right is uh, intent on getting enough of school board members that they can sway policy at the very local level. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, one of the honchos from the uh, the place in Seattle, what was like Discovery, Discovery, Discovery Institute. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, got himself elected to a school board in uh -huh. North Kitsap uh, okay. County, and yeah. so we're keeping an eye on on those okay. school board meetings. So one th one thing then would be to to be mindful of who it is that's running for school board positions, right? Yep. And make sure they aren't being taken over by stealth candidates who and, have their own agenda. And if anybody is uh, you know, suspects anything is going on in their local school, they can give me a call yeah. or they can go to the. AU National website. Yeah, and, and, we'll, and we'll be including your phone number and yeah. email. Uh, and there's also a great program. book here, yes. if we can zoom in on this, yeah. uh, that's kind of a roadmap to uh, uh, 
avoiding the pitfalls and lawsuits, et cetera, involved and with that. And that's uh, just what it says. Religion. Religion. And that's what it says in the front, and you got that memorized, <laughs> yeah. because it says religion in the public schools is a roadmap for a road avoiding map. lawsuits yeah. <laughs> and respecting parents' legal right, yeah. rights. And this is available for free as a download yeah. on the National yeah. AU website. And it's like, it's like 14 bucks if you yeah. want to buy your own hand yeah. copy of it. But the, the, uh, the, the school, school system in Dover, Pennsylvania, when they lost that lawsuit, uh, where they were teaching what was essentially evolution in a school, didn't that cost them some money? I know, I know some of these. Oh yeah, well, some of these cases cost the school. Dover, Dover money. is a classic. Uh, three members of the uh, you know the Discovery Institute uh -huh. type of people got themselves elected to the school board, and between them, I think one other person, they had a majority, so they uh -huh. could force the local schools. They thought yeah. to teach intelligent design and. Uh -huh. And uh, all of the science teachers said, no, we're not going to do it. You uh -huh. can't ma and what's more, you can't make us do it. Yeah. And sure enough, they couldn't make them do it. Right, right. So a couple of parents said, this isn't right. And uh, this is how Dover happened. Parents mm -hmm. getting involved yeah. with their local schools. And so they brought a lawsuit, and it, it went through uh, to the uh, Federal Appeals Court mm -hmm. for uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And of course, the judge just you know, basically slapped them out of court. With right. his, Long 138 page, 143 page uh, decision that's that basically boiled down to saying intelligent design is religion and it's got no place in our classrooms. Right. Well, then they all went crazy by you know calling activist liberal judges, uh, uh, you know, uh, legislating from the bench. Uh -huh. But it turned out that Judge Jones was a uh, conservative was, Republican yeah. and he was a George W. Bush appointee. Right, but but he <laughs> but he respected the Constitution yes. enough to to, mm -hmm. to see that the separation of church and state needs mm -hmm. to be maintained, and so it was very heartening to see that. Yeah. And, and, and that cost them a lot of money to defend that, on that this was what I was lawsuit. Thinking. Was Plus, they had damages. Yeah. And uh, Americans United was involved in that, along with the ACLU and I think a couple other organizations. Uh -huh. And uh, Americans United, they waived collection of their portion of the damages uh -huh. because Dover was just a small little place. Yeah. And in between the time that the lawsuit was filed and the next uh, and, and, and the decision was issued. Had been an election, and all three of these people were booted got, out. That's yeah. what I remember: is the yeah, the voters yeah. saw what was going on, and they didn't want those people. Yeah. Uh, there's another school uh, issue that's of concern, and that has to do with uh, religious school vouchers. For a number of years, people have been urging um, the use of school vouchers that would let people go to private schools, even private religious schools, at taxpayer expense. Uh, can you explain something about how that works? Well, and it doesn't work. Well, <laughs> what the, explain what, but how it's supposed to how work. How it's supposed to work and is what is, really happens. Is that a parent who doesn't want his or her child in the public school can take a portion of their school tax money mm -hmm. and get a voucher, which they can then take to a private school. And as you say, most of the private schools are religiously uh -huh. based or religiously uh -huh. oriented. And there have been, uh, the most recent was in Washington, D.C. And there, were, there was a, a study that was done of the uh, students in the voucher program and the students who remained in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And over the course of, I think, three years of this uh, initial mm -hmm. pilot program, there was virtually no difference between the retention rate, the mm -hmm. dropout rate, and the grades mm -hmm. of the group in the public school and the group that went to the private school. In fact, one student dropped out of the private school because there was too much religion involved, and he went mm -hmm. back to public school. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can imagine that if there are problems with the public schools, it would make sense to fix the problems in the public schools rather than weaken them and, and have this oh, yeah. well, you, you, rogue you're system. Cutting, on, cutting the budget and the schools having a problem anyway and, yeah. then, and then expecting them to you know, come up to a standard that they can't afford right. to do. And then there's a, hasn't there been a practice, I've, this is what I seem to recall, is that people running the private schools like to skim off the best and the brightest hmm. Uh, and then not have to deal with kids that have learning problems or behavior problems, so they're skimming off, mm -hmm. and, and the public schools get stuck with the kids that are most expensive and difficult to, to educate. Yeah, And, and yeah. so it's, a, it's an unfair system. And, and, and the American people are not getting you know, fooled by this. Uh, I think there's been 12 states that have had this up for a statewide vote, uh -huh. and on every occasion it was defeated by a, you know, a resounding majority. Yeah including the last one was in uh, Utah. And uh -huh. that kind of surprised me because if I, th I thought that if any state uh -huh. <laughs> was going to go for a voucher system, it would be Utah. But they, even, you know, they, they said no, too. Eric, there's another um, controversy or another issue that I know that you've uh, been interested in that's 
these faith-based initiatives. When George right. W. Bush was in the White House, right. he started using taxpayer money to fund mm -hmm. some social mm -hmm. service aid or social service programs mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. religious organizations mm -hmm. instead of government agencies right. or other nonprofits. Right. And Obama is continuing that. Yes. Tell us about these faith-based initiatives. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, what you said is was the original idea that uh, taxpayer money was basically being funneled to religious organization to provide social services. I think that was, that was, that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh -huh. uh, however, the problem is, uh, there's two or three problems with that. Number one is there are no adequate safeguards in place to make sure that taxpayer money isn't used to indoctrinate people who come to them for social services. For example, if I'm down on my luck or I'm uh, a victim of a natural disaster or something and there's a religious organization that wants to provide food and shelter, I, I think that's wonderful. But should I have to sit through an indoctrination or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. as a precondition to get this help? I don't think people would necessarily agree that it should be done that way. Another thing that is of great concern on this faith-based based initiative is uh, the idea that uh, you know we have equal employment and equal opportunity mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, and you're taking taxpayer money and you're funding organizations who uh, uh, apparently can or at least do discriminate by uh, having uh, uh, you know you can't work for us unless you belong to our faith kind of uh -huh. thing. Well, yeah. I think, or if you're gay, or if yeah, I think whatever. most Americans would say if yeah. you're taking taxpayer money, yeah. you shouldn't be able to yeah. to make those kinds yeah. of uh, discriminatory yeah. policies. You shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, um, uh, you're uh, see, so you Kent. You've got some concerns about issues that come along around uh, marriage and sexuality. That's a lot of what's in the news. Right. We uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of talk about. Uh, limiting marriage to a man and a woman because uh -huh. that's the way marriage is traditionally defined mm -hmm. and typically that's in a religious context. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a lot of problems with that. One is marriage hasn't always been like that. Uh, marriage has a, uh, a, a large political background. That is, marriage is used to be not based on love in a religious institution but rather um, an alliance between countries, mm -hmm. so kings marrying uh, mm -hmm. uh, somebody else. So it's not that marriage has always been a religious right in order to uh, have children, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so it's not just the current Christian idea of marriage. Um, history hasn't uh, proven that to be the case. Um, also, um, sexuality, uh, if a person is born gay, uh, if it's not fair to make them marry uh, another, uh, somebody of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know why people are gay. There's lots of different reasons. And the idea that you have to be a man and a woman to get married, that's a religious idea mm -hmm. currently and that's imposing a religious view on somebody else's choice as to who to marry. That's fundamentally unfair. Uh, there's no evidence that people can choose to be gay. Mm -hmm. Certainly people say that, but that's not really uh, scientifically shown to be mm -hmm. valid. Mm -hmm. It's just fundamentally unfair. The, the, the notion uh, that you mentioned uh, a moment ago that, that it's for... Uh, uh, man and woman for procreation was part of the reasoning in the uh, state Supreme Court case decision just a couple years ago that that was ruling against uh, marriage of people of the same sex and they said it, it's ready for procreation and it made me wonder do would they would the state Supreme Court say that that like postmenopausal women can't get married or that couples that plan to use birth control all the time, can't get married, or it's the next a guy or you better who's have had children. a vasectomy, <laughs> yeah. a guy who's had a vasectomy can't yeah. get married, or I mean, what kind of s silliness is that? We, we don't want the government to mandate that people have to get married and have children. 
Uh, people should be free to make that decision. Yeah. They should be free to, to decide who their partner is and whether they want to be married to that mm -hmm. partner or not. Mm -hmm. It should not be up to a religion or a religious view to mandate what another person who may or may not have that same religious view mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there, and we've been talking about things that have been like public controversies and some, we've talked also about a couple of court cases uh, and there's a string of court cases, uh, and you have a bunch of them memorized, one going back to 1947 in New Jersey that, that you told me on the phone is a landmark case, and then you mentioned several others. Tell us uh, about a couple of these landmark cases. We're, we're running a bit on time, tight on time, so if we can keep it kind of tight. Okay, just some of the main landmark uh, the 1947 when it dealt with a, I can't remember the name of it now, I had it memorized earlier, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, dealt with a uh, school busing issue and whether a, the local township in New Jersey should pay for schools, for religious schools, uh, to pay for busing for students of religious schools. Oh, okay. But uh, ultimately, they, the Supreme Court made the wrong decision on that. They said it was okay, the wrong decision from my point uh -huh. of view. But that was the one that established in the public mind the phrase, the wall of separation. Okay, but the, that's some, that Madison had said, was it Madison uh, or Je Jefferson? Jefferson? Jefferson had said earlier, Yeah. but that brought it into a Current court it, case. Current mm -hmm. court. Yeah, the uh, first time it was used by the Supreme Court was in 1878. Oh, really? Yeah. So even back then they knew what they were talking about. Okay. And uh, so then the the, the biggie, what everybody's concerned about, was Engel v. Vitale. Well, that's the one in New York that kicked uh, kicked God out of the public schools. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And uh, that got tied up uh, in the public mind with uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare, the yeah. uh, militant, uh, atheist. flamboyant atheist, yeah. Yeah. and she was always good copy, so she got on TV a yeah. lot. So, so it became about her <laughs> instead of the legal principle, mm -hmm. but, which is that you shouldn't have taxpayers promoting prayer and the, on the, these innocent right. students who are being indoctrinated right. against and their And the, the ironic thing was she wasn't involved in that case. No. <laughs> she was involved in the case that, that came around next year that, that uh, um, I can't remember the name of it now, yeah. but uh, she was only marginally involved with that. There, but, you know, there, like I say, she was. Yeah. She was. Yeah. There was a Lemon versus Kurtzman case in '71. Yes, that's the one that established the uh, Lemon test, which is a three-part test okay. to judge any action on the part of a. This is, it was a school district case, but it was yeah. generally applicable to uh -huh. government in that. The first part is that the action must have a legitimate secular purpose. Okay. And it can have it can have a religious purpose that's secondary to that, but, but its it's primary like, purpose has to be secular. Okay. That it neither promotes nor inhibits uh, religion and the free exercise thereof. And the uh -huh. third thing is that it can't intertwine government and religion to a substantial degree. It okay. works to that effect. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, it's like so many court cases. Uh, you know, it's open to interpretation. Yeah. That's why yeah. we. That's why after Lemon. We still got this you know, rolling thunder of yeah. court cases yeah. about uh, religion in schools. We, I want to revisit something we talked about earlier just to make sure that in the minds of the viewers they don't get a sense that uh, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State is anti-religious. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we come down on the side of principles, mm -hmm. but it's not really against religion. Uh, do you have other ways that you have of answering the question if somebody says, is your organization against religion? I would say uh, just the opposite, actually. That's the whole point of the Americans United is to preserve uh, the religious diversity and uh, to allow people to, to follow their own beliefs. And uh, I don't think that's anti-religious at all. I think that uh, we're for an environment that actually encourages uh, religion uh -huh. or, or lack of religion if, yeah. depending on the individual's belief. But, but it's the individual choice instead of yes. a government imposition. That's it's so interesting right. to see so many people who call themselves conservatives mm -hmm. and are trying to limit the scope of government mm -hmm. but then they want big government to tell you how to pray. Yes. Or tell your kids how to pray. Yeah. Or something yeah. and it's like no, no, no. These are people who, who um, um, are, are concerned that, that government can't do things right. That that you know, if government touches something, they're going to turn it to, to crap. Right. And they want the government to be running religion. It's yes. like, ooh, if I if I were, I, I happen to be religious, uh -huh. but but if if I were anti religion if I were trying to destroy religion, the, a great way to do it, we'd make it a government agency, <laughs> yep. make it a government function, <laughs> and it becomes a, a routine, meaningless uh -huh. Uh -huh. thing that people have to recite a prayer at the beginning of 
whatever that or something. And it becomes a meaningless function, whereas prayer should be something deep yeah. inside yeah. with spiritual value. And to make it a government regulation is a way to trivialize it it's and destroy the value of it. Right. And so I'm just always mystified why people who claim to support religion and oppose big government want to have big government dictating religion. Mm -hmm. Ugh. It's just, it's, it's creepy. It, it doesn't, and then who decides it doesn't compute. Religion? Yeah, it doesn't well, there's, compute. Well, there's a group called the Dominionists. Are you familiar with them? And their, a little bit. their goal is to turn this into a theocracy. They're not making bones about it. You know, yeah, they, want, they want this yeah. run, run by biblical yeah. law, yeah. which will entail you know, stoning of adulteresses. Yeah. But that's, that's Adulterer is another that's story. The, that's the <laughs> Taliban. <laughs> that's the Taliban mentality. Yeah. Here. Yeah, it's yeah. the stoning yeah. of homosexuals. Yeah, it's really, really dangerous. Um, are there some other ways that are helpful to think about this? There's, you know, in the course of all these public controversies and, and things in the news, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of sloppy thinking going on, but there's also some, some clear thinking, and I appreciate the clear thinking that you're contributing here on this program. Are there some other ways, other angles or insights that, that you could share? Um, well, I, I, I came across a quote here uh, uh, that I thought was very interesting, uh, considering the person who said it, and uh -huh. perhaps I can share that with do you. That. Please do. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have it memorized, so if you'll allow me to, to pull this Perfect. out. Yeah. <clears throat> this kind of sticks with me, and I think you'll see why. Uh, this is from Senator Barry Goldwater. Uh, in 1994, he wrote, quote, I am a conservative Republican, but I believe in democracy, <laughs> and the separation of church and state. The conservative movement is founded on the simple tenet that people have the right to live life as they please as long as they don't hurt anyone else in the process. Mm -hmm. I thought about this and I thought, yeah, that's right. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it seems like there are many people these days who are uh, criticizing people for having this very view. Yeah, and, and he was a... And he was Very a conservative prominent. Republican. Yeah, yeah. And, and now many conservative Republicans are, uh, are yeah. saying that uh, uh, many uh, people who don't go along with that are just, you know, are, aren't thinking correctly or don't have the right belief. And yeah. Yeah. it's just amazing to me that Barry Goldwater says that, and yeah. that's what I believe. And yeah, <laughs> the, the 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 mixture of. of uh, people at different points along the political spectrum and the yes. religious spectrum, I think, are yes. interesting. Um, you know, people, uh, the issues of church and state have, have most recently been uh, folks from, from um, conservative religious mm -hmm. orientations. And, and I, I would be just as much opposed, and I suspect you would too, if, if we had, like, left-wing religious people mm -hmm. wanting to do mm -hmm. the same thing. If somebody mm -hmm. said, you know, we want to impose... Uh, uh, you know, Unitarian theology on everybody, or something. You know, it doesn't matter if it's no, we would be conservative, to that middle of the road, mm -hmm. liberal. It, it, it's the principle that's involved, and not where you want mm -hmm. on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that and that uh, Goldwater quote is is mm -hmm. very good. Uh, yeah. it, so, um, uh, let's see, had some other notes. Some some years ago, I, I think in, in whatever these controversies are. I think it's important for people from different points on the spectrum and different beliefs to be able to come together and, and talk in a, uh, a civil way mm -hmm. with differences. And some years ago, probably 20 years ago, um, I brought together some people for a conversation in my house uh, about a, a controversial issue, but people who differed in ways. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen a uh, video about some people in some city in Missouri who had uh, pro-life uh, people and anti-abortion people mm -hmm. who had, in that community, they'd try to figure out how can we stop fighting each other and find something we have in common. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that they had a joint, uh, a mutual interest in stopping unwanted pregnancies mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that served both the choice sure. aspect and sure. reduced the number of abortions that would occur. Mm -hmm. And so they actually collaborated and they formed an organization that was doing good sex education and good um, uh, reproductive uh, planning and care and so, and so forth, family planning. And so I, I borrowed the video of that and had a couple friends who were on different points 
Um, and we watched it, and it was an interesting yeah. conversation. Yes. But the, the ground rule was, come over to my house, and we'll watch this, but we'll do it in a civil way. So I was careful to invite people that I yes. knew were capable of having a civil conversation, right. which right. some people aren't. Yeah. But I think that's, those kinds of things would be very interesting to do on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, Geez, we've, be, we've become so polarized now. It's that, good luck on getting a, a, a group together without yeah, chainsaws. That, that's the, that's <laughs> the hard, hard thing here. Let's, let's talk for a bit about the organization that, that you're all with, the American mm -hmm. uh, United for the Separation of Church and State. Um, it's, you've got members in, in every state, and you have 79 chapters nationwide. Um, and so what does AU do? We are primarily educational and watchdog. Mm -hmm. So like if people have a question, they were talking earlier, if any parents have a question about religious practice in the schools, you know, mm -hmm. come to us if, they, if there's a case, you know, we can go and educate the, you know, the offending party. Mm -hmm. And we also act as watchdogs, like the case in Dover. Mm -hmm. You know, Americans United was all over that. Mm -hmm. and, and you take legal action. I know there are cases where mm -hmm. something comes up and somebody from AU will write a letter that mm -hmm. offers some good sound legal advice. Mm -hmm. right. And in some cases, the, the government or the school or whatever will, will stop doing what's yeah, usually, offensive. Usually that's all, all it takes is a letter yeah. from AU because yeah. they know we have a good legal staff yeah. and that we're ready to go to the mat if necessary. Well, and that you've got the Constitution on your side. Right, yes. So, which helps. Right. Theoretically, it should help. I want to promote the website. It's a simple one. It's just your first two initials. It's www.au.org. Mm -hmm. And it's very informative. There's just a lot of good stuff on there about the issues and mm -hmm. you can contact. There's a thing you can click on to find the chapter nearest your locality, wherever you live in the country and, and stuff. Right. Um, and in the summer of 2007, a local, a local South Sound chapter that you're a key person with formed um, to, you serve Thurston County and several counties in southwestern Washington and kind of up to the peninsula. Yeah, up the peninsula too. We have members that are, you know, they never make it to meetings because it's too far yeah. to drive, but we yeah. have members that are affiliated with us from Port Townsend, Port Angeles, and up that area. And we go as far south as the uh, as Lewis County. Uh -huh. And beyond that, it's Cowlitz County. There's a chapter in Vancouver that takes care of Cowlitz okay. County. Okay. But we're basically, you know, Tacoma, south to the uh, Cal to, yeah, to Lewis County. Lewis County and out, out to the ocean. coast and up, yeah. Okay, okay. And and you meet monthly, typically 6.30 on... Is it the third, third, Tuesday. third Tuesday of the month at the Unitarian Church right. in the west side of Olympia? Um, and but it's that, nice people. That's for now. That's for now. That, that may but, be but changing. It, but yeah, because they're remodeling. reworking and remodeling yeah. the church. And so yeah. last month we met at a uh, pizza parlor. Okay. And so, yeah, that was, we, we got an amazing turnout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we may so, be doing more of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you may do that. <laughs> and I know that, that the local AU chapter has done some tabling uh, at different Places you tabled the farmers market and, and uh, the, the, the various uh, like the community boat events. festival the yeah the harbor Hamp days on harbor uh, days uh, hemp fest the uh, oh the gay pride day I forget yeah. what it's called yeah. the yeah. rainbow yeah yeah the, yeah, the, the pride celebration yeah, yeah pride celebration yeah so there's several different community events that you folks are at and that, mm -hmm. that really helps to educate the public and give people what kind of response do you get when people come up and meet you. Well, it's been interesting. <laughs> yeah, to say the you least. get a variety. <laughs> yeah. You have a wide variety. Yeah. Uh -huh. People come up and start arguing with you. Uh -huh. and yeah. We were at Hempfest, and this, uh, I don't want to say she's an older lady because she was younger than me, but she's uh -huh. older than the, what you would think would be the typical crowd uh -huh. for the Hempfest. Uh -huh. So she came up and said, what are you people all about? And, uh, uh -huh. and I went through uh -huh. my spiel. And the more I went through the spiel, the, the angrier I could see her face getting. Uh -huh. And she uh -huh. says, well, you know, this is a Christian nation. And I said, no, that's a popular misconception. Uh -huh. Here's a pamphlet. So I have, uh -huh. a, you know, we have pamphlets yeah. on a lot right. of these topics. And yeah. I gave her the pamphlet. She's going, going through it. And, uh -huh. you know, her face is getting red and <laughs> steam's uh -huh. coming out of her ears. Uh -huh. And finally, when she says, she walks off, she says, well, she says, God bless you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the gal yeah. the next, uh, next booth said, I don't think she meant bless you. <laughs> But, but I know you get good response because people sort of know the name and, yeah. and it must be gratifying for some people to actually find you mm -hmm. in person. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah you, we really do get the response all over the spectrum. Yeah. And I, I think part of that is people just don't understand what the group's about. Yeah. I think there's a lot of misconception. Yeah. For example, we talked about Madeline Murray O'Hara. Yeah. And, 
you know, her, she gets involved in that kind of case, AU is involved in that kind of case, even though she's not involved in the same case as AU is, yeah. next thing you know, people think it's an atheist organization, right, right. and they associate Americans United with an atheist, yeah. and all yeah. of a sudden everybody thinks, you know, yeah. we're against religion and we're all yeah. a bunch of atheists, yeah. and that's just plain not correct. Right. Well, I want to see if you have any closing thoughts. I want to uh, hear from each of you just a brief thing, and then I'll do a closing thing, and we'll give a little plug for the organization. And uh, at the end. So what, do you have closing thoughts from any of you? Okay, I can go. Uh, I got into this organization several years ago, but I was one of those guys that just paid his dues and you know, didn't really do anything. But you know, then I was getting close to retirement and I needed something to fill up my uh -huh. extra time. Uh -huh. And uh, I also you know, watched the rise of the religious right and I don't mm -hmm. want the American Taliban to turn this into a Christianized version of Iran. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think it's very important to, to keep them separate, as I mentioned earlier, to keep the integrity of both the religious institutions and, and the faith, keep that pure in our laws. Um, religion is so open to different interpretations that to give a minority of a religious view political power to enact laws that impose a particular belief onto other people who don't mm -hmm. share that belief that's also fundamentally unfair. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, I agree. Like I said earlier in our conversation, uh, I really think that uh, the separation of church and state has allowed this country to become as great as it is. And uh, we've avoided things like the, the Catholics versus the Protestants in Ireland. We've avoided uh, the sectarian fighting of the Balkans. We've avoided mm -hmm. all that. And instead of spending our time killing each other because of our religious beliefs, we can devote that time to something that's productive yeah. that has resulted in this great country that we have. Yeah, yeah. Th I appreciate all of those insights and all the information you shared. I want to thank Dennis Mansker and Kent Underwood and Eric Quist. Um, and I want to thank all the folks who've been watching as well. And I want to just follow up on, on what you said there, that the, the value of that diversity is mm. really is what makes mm -hmm. this country work. And for those who believe in the marketplace of ideas, that old classic notion that if people keep um, exchanging mm -hmm. that that we get closer and closer to the truth. I think mm -hmm. it's a powerful thing. Right. The United States Constitution's First Amendment protects Americans from governmental bias in religion and religious matters. The government must not provide either overt or covert support or opposition for any particular religion. And each person is free to believe in any religion or none without discrimination. It's a basic civil right and the Constitution protects it and civil rights laws protect it. Um, there are some people who don't want to support that approach and they want to impose their views on others and it's important that we stand up for all of us so that nobody gets picked on. And I, I do appreciate the work that Americans United for the Separation of Church and State has been doing since 1947. It really is non-sectarian, it's not partisan, uh, it has a wide diversity of, of members it's not liberal, it's not conservative, it just protects everybody's constitutional rights. And the people who developed this constitution in this country, Thomas, Madison, or Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and the others, uh, were just adamant that we make sure that we protect this new country from uh, abuse and uh, discrimination. And uh, when we do that, it becomes a win-win situation for everybody, whether you're religious or spiritual or not. For information locally, you can contact Dennis Mansker at 786-9584. You can email him at dmansker at comcast.net. You can contact the national level at Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, 518 C Street, Northeast, Washington, D.C., 2002, 2002. Three zeros in the middle. It's, it reads the same left to right or right to left. Um, a two at each end and three zeros in the middle. Uh, the, the website is www.au.org. For information about a wide variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, nonviolent social change, or uh, the contact information we've mentioned on this program, you can contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 4919093. Uh, we are all one human family. We all share one planet. We can make a better world, but we all have to work at it, and the world needs exactly what you have to offer.
things.